Hello, and welcome to another edition of my pirate radio show. I'm Devlin, and uh, thank you very much for joining me on this episode. Uh, before I get started on my segment, I want to talk about a segment I did a couple weeks ago. I had a little bit of a breakdown, and I even considered not airing the the show um, well, at least that uh, that segment. At the last minute, I was going to try to, you know, tape another segment, but I let it go, and I put it out there in the universe. And once again, my incredible fans uh, and listeners just came to my defense on doing that, uh, and said that. You know, it's funny. I'll I'll do segments and I'll get a little bit of feedback, but then I'll do segment that I'm so not sure I should put out there. And having this breakdown, and I didn't know if it was something I should do. But then people wrote to me, and some of them, you know, commended me for just being so raw. Some of them said, you know, it was. I had one person tell me they actually. They think I'm at my best when I'm at low period, um, which is sad because I'm not going to just be depressed just to make good radio. <laughs> it's just not what I'm going to do. Uh, but I also had a lot of people who also said they go through what I go through. And once again, my my braveness, and when I say braveness, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back or give myself an ego, um, but that's the words they used. And I don't think of it as brave, but if somebody tells me it's brave and they felt comfort from it and said that they could never say the words I did but it's nice that it's out there in the universe maybe people will think this is what happens to real people more than we like to know and uh, so for that I, I thank you all I'm lucky to have such a support group anyhow my first segment today is uh, going to be more of a positive speaking type thing. This is going to be a up, up, because I'm in a really good mood, and uh, it's just going to be a really positive episode. Well, I hope. I guess anything could happen. I could talk about something that gets me moody, but my first segment is going to be called The Greatest Love of All. And no, not the Whitney Houston song. Um, I just, we put so much pressure on ourselves as people um, to find love and, you know, our one true love, our soulmates. And I've talked to you before about, I'm sure I have, whether on this podcast or if you and I were just sitting down having a cup of coffee, I'm a strong believer on we get more soulmates than one. Uh, I don't know what it is, if it's society or media always plays up the, you get one soulmate in life and you have to find them. I don't believe that. I've met many, and I think soulmates come in different Forms. Yes, they come in as lovers. Uh, they come in as spouses and boyfriends and girlfriends. But I think we put too much emphasis on the one great love of our life. Okay? Because of the fact there's a lot of pressure out there. People, I think, just go out. Sometimes I think they settle and jump into relationships that don't work because, you know, it feels comfortable. Or it just feels, okay, this is nice. It feels good. This must be love. And it is. Love is like that. But um, but I think the problem, and what I want to talk about specifically, is how we're kind of forced into that belief that there's just one great love of our life. And in this text, I'm not saying it is just love related. I absolutely love Mike, and he is one of the greatest loves of my life. But also, I have Corda in my life. And um, I remember a teacher once told me, and when I was a kid, it blew my mind, because I didn't believe it. They said, you're going to meet tons of people in your life. They're going to come and go, friends, family, everything. But at the end of your life, on your deathbed, you're going to be able to count the people who were your, who've been there, are going to be there on one hand. If you're lucky, you can make it to a second hand, but most people barely fill a first hand. Now, as a kid, when I heard that, that freaked me right out. I, I You know, because I'm thinking, well, if we meet all these people, but as I've talked about in the past, I, I get that now. 
for me, I actually think I've got, I'd say, five great loves right now. And uh, I have a lot of people in my life that I love and I hold close and cherish, but like ones that I feel like literally could rip my heart out if I lost them. And and I I respect that and I don't hide it. You know, Mike knows my love for Corda. I won't sit here and name all the people because it's just not fair, but I'm sure some of you know who you are and others, you know, he might not be in my five greatest loves of all time, but that doesn't mean I don't hold you in a special place. Because uh, I think that's what we're on this earth for, is to make as many connections as we can. Um, and those connections don't have to be long term. I can inspire someone and never see them again. And then, you know, years later say, hey, you know what? You inspired me to do that. And thank you. And then you realize your emotional impact. And then there's people in my life I see all the time. Uh, but the problem is, is that, as I said, society and media keeps playing up the one great love of your life. And it's always usually about romance or love. And I think some people, when they get older and they realize that, oh, I don't know if I'm ever going to find that person. Or some people find it later in life, and I, I always think it's better. Uh, I love the idea of, you know, high school sweethearts. But to be honest with you, I think I found love later in life. Maybe I'm just jaded. But I think I have a better understanding of who I am. And I think it's better when you're not in your growing stages to have a partner that's, you know, you, you pretty much know where you are, you know where you are. I find that people get together young, they tend to, they grow. And sometimes it's wonderful because they grow together, but a lot of times they grow apart because they become different people when, you know, they get their careers going, you know, even when they become parents and stuff. But anyhow, uh, I think it too, people kick themselves too much for it. And I think we need to reanalyze this greatest love of all. Because I think, one, you're allowed to have more than one. But two, the greatest love of your life doesn't have to be a love relationship. I have seen some friends who may never get married. Or one of them gets married, the other doesn't. Yet, those two together work. And you can just tell that one without the other is just horrible. I have seen mothers and daughters. I've seen mothers and sons. I've seen fathers and sons have this bond that is like the greatest love of all. And we need to nurture that. Because, you know, you know, yeah, we watch rom-coms and, you know, romantic comedies. And everybody wants to find that one true love. But... We can't kick ourselves if we don't because of the fact that love can be anything. And I've seen, I know people who have dedicated their lives to take care of a parent. And they live together. And then when that parent dies, they just seem lost in the world because that was their greatest love of all. And you should cherish that. And I'm glad I've met people that actually do, but some people still kick themselves because it's like, oh, I never fell in love, I never had kids. You know what? Your greatest loves of all can come all over the place. They they can come from any means, I, and I think we need to embrace that. If your greatest love is your brother, or your greatest love is your aunt, or your uncle, or your sister, you get what I'm saying. Embrace it. If your greatest love of all is your best friend. I know some people that are in relationships, but I think they'd be devastated more if their best friend disappeared or died or left their lives. It's just because there's a bigger connection. Then I've also seen, I don't want to go dark, but I've seen couples that have broken apart from other people. And you find out that it has a lot to do with the one couple being jealous of the other one. And that right there, if you ever see that you're in a relationship that tries to break off another friendship, that should be red lights there telling you this is not a good thing. But I'm, that's not what this is about, so I'm going to say that. But, you know, we need to embrace the greatest love of all. And we also have to embrace some other things. Some people dedicate their lives to their career. 
and some careers, it's hard to hold a relationship. So sometimes your greatest love of all can be your career or even your passion, your hobby, if you paint or make music. That can be your greatest love. And some people can manage to have a successful career and love affairs, and some don't, and they just, you know, dedicate their lives to it, and some totally embrace it, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's great when you can have that balance, because I would assume, I would assume at the end of a life, you know, you can say, I accomplished a lot, and that's great, but when you're looking around and there's nobody around, I think it's a little sad, but that sense of accomplishment must fill some kind of void. So I, I think that can also be, you know, whether you, you know, love things. Like if you love to travel, that can be your greatest love. That can be your greatest love. And if you can find someone that, you know, travels with you, whether it's a friend or a relative or a love, like somebody you fell in love with, it's great because you connect on that. And then there's another love in your life. I'm only, when I say I have five great loves in my life, I'm talking people. But when I think about it, I have other great loves in my life. I love movies. I love creating things, whether it's a stage play or a podcast. I get an, when I am in a, a perfect zone, I just get so filled with passion doing these podcasts. And I feel that it comes out because people tell me that, that they can just feel me. It's not just words. Uh, they feel my passion and my tone, and that makes me feel great. We need to grasp the greatest loves of our lives. Um, we need to let them know. We also need to move on from them. I don't think I've seen anything more sad than when I see people who've been together forever, and then one of them passes away. And the other one just totally shuts down. Whether this is your husband, your wife, a, a parent, a sibling, a friend, it's heartbreaking. Uh, the reason I find it heartbreaking is because... Now, I've lost many people in my life when my parents left. It was very traumatic time. Uh, I also had a friend... Uh, I've lost a couple friends, but... One of my friends was Tia Scheiber, who was only about 18, 19 when she died. And that was real rough, because I was older than her, but you never expect a young person to die. And when I had another friend, Norm McLeod, who I absolutely loved, and we grew up pretty much together, he was literally one year older than me. Uh, sorry, one week older than me. And I would always make fun of how young I was when, you know, and when he turned 40 and stuff. I'm still going to be a week of 39. And we, we, we lost contact, and then I found out he passed away, and I got to go to his funeral. And I realized that he didn't even make it to 40. And these weren't, these were people who meant the world to me, but... They weren't the loves of my lives, but they were important in shaping me. So they were very important to me, and I loved them very much. But I always learned that when people die, you be sad. But if you break down, and those times, my parents, my friends, when I lost them, I, I lost it. And, you know, I had my depressed moments. I had my dark moments shed. But I immediately picked myself up and moved on. And it wasn't in any way forgetting them. They have both, Tia and Norm, have been out of my life for years. And here I am talking about them. I'm keeping them alive with my words. I talk about my parents all the time on this podcast. But when people start breaking down and they don't, reach out anymore and they just close themselves off and pretty much they're dead you're not paying tribute to these people that touched your lives you are basically you are almost letting them die in vain because 
if I died and Mike was left all alone, now he's not the kind to go reach out, but I'd hope he'd still try to stay in contact with the friends we've made because he knows that I don't want to be thinking of him being all alone here on planet Earth and not, you know, it, it would be horrible. And I don't want them to, like, I don't want to give up my life. I want to, in my way, it's paying tribute to their lives even more. Now, that being said, my parents were close to being the greatest loves of my life, but not quite. They were just, you know, immense love for them. But, um, but I haven't lost anyone really 100% close to me. Your parents certainly are up there. And for some of you, even more so. And I'm not saying I was not close to my parents. But what I am saying is that I've never felt like, you know, that loss. My parents were also older, lived, you know, fairly good lives, and were both very ill. And that's what kind of made it easier. But I see so many times people will just give up. They'll say how hard it is. I I, uh, I know somebody, and I won't say names. I certainly, this is not about, you know, pointing fingers. But they basically used to love Christmas. And they don't celebrate Christmas. They don't even put up a tree. Um, and I can see maybe, maybe the first year. Um, but... They haven't done it in years, and to me it's so sad, because it should be a time to remember that person, and, you know, I'm sure that person doesn't want to think of how lonely they are on Christmas, and how sad situation it is, because, you know, they might be in heaven, but you're putting yourself through hell, and to me, you need to celebrate that. That being said, if I ever lose one of the five great loves of my life, <laughs> I will let you know how well I hold up. Um, I doubt it's going to be good, but I do hopefully will intend to celebrate their lives. I may have gotten a little bit off track, but what I'm saying to you is look around and cherish all the relationships you have, how big, how small. If you have a friend that makes you smile just when you get an email from them or if you get a couple of hours with them, smile, enjoy it. But then really look to say, I think this person might be one of the great loves of my life. Don't just assume it's going to be the person you fall in love with. Yes, that could be one of them. But you might have a friend that like, wow, they're always there for me. I always try to be there for them. This is another great love of my life. Whether it's your kids, your siblings. Look around, find them, and embrace them all. But um, if you are a person who doesn't think they've found their greatest love of their life, look around. Who's the most important person to you? Because that could be the greatest love of your life at that very moment. So anyhow, stop putting pressure on ourselves. And don't be afraid to be a glutton. Have as many as you want. But you'll know the true ones at the end of the day. Anyhow, I think that was a nice positive way to start things. And with spring hopefully finally coming into the air, that's what I'm going for today. We are going to change things up a bit. I'm going to talk about trains for no reason. Just a segment on some train stories I want to share with you. And we'll be doing that right after this. And we are back and... Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about trains. I don't know where this popped into my head. Uh, but I just thought, hey, I do have a couple train stories. And um, actually, I do know where I came in my head. I was talking to uh, a friend who lives overseas, Richard. And he, he listens regularly. And um, I remember he mentioned in one of the emails about how we'd go to the train track. And it was kind of a, like a secret place we'd go. Uh, it would just be, I believe it was like past Barton Street and walking towards. Uh, I, I don't know my directions, but anyhow. Uh, and it was, it's a wonderful time. And it just reminded me of little trains. And I don't know if this is going to be an interesting segment at all, but I've always had a fascination with trains and a fear of them. 
Uh, believe it or not, I don't, like, when I say a fear of them, it's not actually the train itself. Uh, what it is, is I remember when I go on a GO train, or even when I was in the Toronto subway, whenever I see the train or the subway coming, and there's this little, little platform that you're on, that basically, as the train goes by with that huge wind, I fear... And even as an adult, and this started when I was like a kid, but I actually fear that that wind is going to pick me up and throw me under the tracks. Uh, I know, it's not normal. Uh, maybe it is, I don't know, but I do. And I also, the weird thing is too, and not really weird, because excitement and fear kind of go together, but it also excites me um, just because the wind that you're feeling when the train goes by is just so incredible. And even if you are going to be whisked under the train, and, you know, it's it's almost the excitement of not knowing if this is the last breath in your life. I swear, I'm not trying to get morbid here. I am not. I'm saying this with a gigantic smile on my face. But there is a rush, a very, like, huge, almost, like, I won't say erotic, but maybe. Uh, but it's but it's a fear and this thing. And even today, even like I I go sometimes up to Whitby on the train, or sometimes Toronto, and I just ah, oh, it's just wonder a wonderfully crazy feeling that I still get to this day. But anyhow, um, Richard, I've I've talked to, about him before in my segments last summer about 1985 and Richard used to take me to the railroad tracks and we would just walk along the track sometimes we'd just sit there and we'd watch the odd train go by we never did anything goofy as far as I remember like we didn't try to you know outrun the train or dodge the train or anything like that and I certainly don't commend it or recommend it by any means you know, we didn't have a footloose moment where, you know, Laurie Singer's standing on the track screaming. And, um, and, uh, yeah, and then Kevin Bacon comes and runs. So I'm thinking about, you know, that whole crazy thing where he jumps in front of the tracks and pulls her off because he doesn't think she's going to make it. We didn't do things like that, but it was a great place for us to go and have deep talks. Um, and, you know, when you're a teenager, every talk you have is deep. It doesn't matter if you're talking about school or, you know, the alienation you feel or, you know, just anything. Everything's a deep talk when you're a teenager. Actually, I, I think everything's a deep talk when you're older, too. I just think people lose the ability to talk as real as we did as teenagers. But anyhow, I love those moments. He, he mentioned, you know, it, it's sad when we get older, you know, you almost lose or forget those secret places where you can go and the world doesn't see you for a bit. Um, and he's, he's right. And I think that's kind of what warmed my heart to talk about this because then I thought about just feelings that I got around trains. I remember when I was younger, I uh, I used to watch a show called Life Goes On. And it was a, a show that, actually, it was a family who lived with a Down Syndrome boy named Corky. But as the show went on, they tackled other topics. They even had one of the first, TV's first gay characters. Uh, sorry, not gay characters. Characters with HIV. The character wasn't gay, but he developed HIV. Um, and I remember there was an episode where they used to go down to the train track, and it always reminded me of Richard and I. And... Um, they waited till the train came, and when the train came, they screamed at the top of their lungs. And just because the noise of the train could, like, wipe out your scream, and so the world couldn't hear you scream. And I don't think Richard and I ever did that, but... I know he's listening right now, and what he might not know is 
I did actually go one time, because I always was with Richard, and sometimes, you know, we had other people with us. Mostly it was just Richard and I, but I do remember a time that we had another guy there. Anyhow, that's not important. But anyhow, I did go one time after he left Europe. And I went down there just to kind of reflect, and he won't know this story at all. But I remember being down there, and I didn't stay very long, because it was weird not being with him. But I remember when the train went by, that I actually screamed at the top of my lungs. And it was directed at him, but it wasn't necessarily an anger. Our friendship kind of disappeared, and I'm happy to say it's come back now. But we had a lot of question marks in our friendship and our relationship. You know, we were still friends, but there was not the intensity that we had before. And when I heard he left, I just, he was a hard void to fill in my heart. And when that train went by, I just decided, hey, because of that show, I'm going to scream at the top of my lungs. And I did, and it felt great. And that was the last time I ever went down to the train track, like intentionally, you know, if you walk and there's a train track, but not th that area. I don't know if I'll ever get back down there, you know. I like to go for walks, but I think, I don't know if I'd go back down there. Because to me, it was always a place Richard and I would meet. So trains, you know, that's one small aspect of trains, but I actually love train travel. The other times I go on trains, or as I said, when I go to Toronto or if I go to Whitby to, sometimes I've visited my family and Mike and I will go and um, and visit and we'll take the train up because Mike doesn't really like to drive, like highway driving a lot unless he absolutely has to, but the train is a nice trip and, or sometimes, you know, even at Christmas, if it looks stormy, my brother and, you know, and Marilyn will it will go on a train. And, you know, because it's just easier than having to deal with, you know, driving in snow. And, and, and we'd all be there. And I love that train travel. I realized how much I loved it when I went by myself. A couple times I visited in Whitby by myself. And uh, most recently, I, I tend to have a, a trip uh, at least once a year, and I see my nephew. And I actually love the train trip up there. And I don't, it's great when Mike's there and we can talk or just be there. We sometimes listen to music together. We have a, a splicer on my, my music and we just listen to it. But I love the actual travel. And um, from here to Whitby, when you drive, it's only about like an hour or 20 minutes, half hour, but it's about a two and a half hour ride when you take the train because they have all the stops and everything. But I absolutely adore it. And I usually go early in the morning and I love just putting my headphones on and then just watching, you know, just the feel of being on the train and the mystery of it all. And I don't know what I enjoy most. Uh, I love looking out the window and seeing, you know, sides of Canada that you don't see. What I actually really like seeing is not only seeing the little towns and some, some of the beauty that you see, but I sometimes even like the darker sides, as in you'll see factory areas, but you'll actually see the back of them. And you'll see, like, kids with graffiti and stuff. And sometimes the graffiti looks horrible. Sometimes it looks great. But I just love seeing that there's other secret places that people may have met. Because it's a railroad track, so it could be a beautiful area that, you know. And I think maybe there's other people, like teenagers, that meet there and talk and do graffiti and weigh the weight of the world on their shoulders because of that. And I love that. And the other thing I like to do is I watch the people on the train and wonder about their lives, wonder where they're going or if they're going to work. Sometimes you can tell they're going to work. You know, they've got briefcases or laptops. But then you see some with luggage and you wonder if they're going to a family get-together. Are they looking forward to it? Are they meeting up with a, a secret friend or a lover? Or are they going to see family but hate it? You know, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be a long two days. I like 
to see and judge to see where they are. And sometimes it's really wonderful. You'll see, like, you know, a couple that are, like, just thick as thieves in the corner. And you can just tell they're going to have a fabulous day wherever they go. And then you see somebody that you can't really read. And you wonder, like, are they going to, like, a funeral? Or are they going to a, you know, just an awkward meeting? You know, like, as in somebody they hadn't talked to in a long time. And they're going to meet with them for the first time and you're wondering if it's going to feel the same or if it's just going to be awkward. And I love that. And I, I, I picture that all with the train because there's so much. Now, you can do that anywhere in life, but with the train, there's that travel. And since I've only been on a plane like twice in my life and I was very young, I guess that's why I like the train so much because it, it gives me that sense of traveling. I've always wondered if I could actually travel like really far places like on train, but I don't know if I could. But I actually love traveling, whether it's in a car or on a train. Um, I don't know about a plane. As I said, I was very young when I went on a plane, and I think it still scares me a little bit. But um, I don't know if I could do it or not. It would have to be under very important circumstances, because the thought of it scares me. And I'm just more afraid of, once I'm in the sky, if I'm going to be, you know, okay. Because it's not like you can step out and grab a, you know, breath of fresh air or something. But we're not talking about planes and my fear of them or anything. Uh, my love of trains, as I say, I kind of look forward to it. Um... Some days I just want to jump on a train and just go for a couple hours to hang out in Toronto or, you know, any of the other places. I always wanted to be bold and just pick a random train station and just get off of it. Like the small little, like, Mimico's or Clarkson or, uh, you know, all the little places that they say on my way to Toronto or Whitby and just get out and be an adventurer. Um, but I think I'd want to person with me. I think I'd want to share that moment with a friend. Um, but some days I think, I should just do that. I should just do that. Just go on a train, pick a random spot and explore. Um, but it, I think a friend would be a good one to do that with. But anyhow, yeah, I, I get a soft spot for trains. I also think trains are very old style. You know, they always talk about how fast you can get somewhere in a plane or a jet. But then I'm, you know, and that's wonderful and that's awesome. But trains still have that nostalgic feel to them. The only time they don't really have a nostalgic feel is that if you're in a hurry and you get stopped at a train stop. Um, and they just, like, you're waiting and you're waiting. Oh, it's got to come now. And it's like a clown car. It's basically one. Then... But still, even then, I like watching the trains go by. It's more if I'm in a hurry and, you know, Mike has to stay there. And But uh, I actually, as I said, love trains. These stories aren't great, but I'm glad I shared them with you. And next time you're on a train, who knows, maybe you'll start finding yourself doing the same thing as me, whether you're looking out the window and seeing the world pass by you, or you look at the the riders and see... Where are they going? Where are they off to? Is it a good story? Is it a bad story? Is it a sad story? And maybe you'll find yourself doing that. And uh, hey, thank you if you do, because I think that'd be a lot of fun. Actually, it makes me really want to go on a train. But uh, yeah, maybe this summer. As I said, most summers I get to at least go on a train once. But maybe I should just go and do something like that. Who knows? Who knows? This is a year for trying something new. So maybe that'll be it. I'm going to jump on a train and just pick a place. I wish I could dress like a hobo, though. You know, I'm not trying to put down homeless people, but, you know, the old-style hobo with the, the little stick with the bag in it. Because I always have to have something with me. You know when I travel, I always have to have at least a bottle of water, or some music, a little speaker in case I want to share that music. Um, yeah, I'd be the weirdest hobo because I'd have, like, music coming out of my backpack as I traveled. Okay, I don't want to hop trains. That's, uh, now it's getting crazy because now it's, hobos don't just 
take a train. And why am I saying the word hobo? I know I love the word a lot, but yeah, I'm not planning to hop trains and start a new life somewhere else. But maybe I'll just buy a ticket and just randomly get off at a stop. We'll see. We'll see. I speak brave, but when it comes to actually doing it, I don't know if it'll happen or not. Anyhow, that's my segment on trains, and I'm going to take a short break, and then I've got some serious stuff to talk about. Okay, not so serious, but I hope somebody listens to it uh, and takes it a little bit, because all advice is a grain of salt, and I'm going to give some advice to the young gay people out there from an old gay person, and that's coming up next. And welcome back. Devlin here with you, and my pirate radio show continues. And now I'm going to give some advice. And um, this is advice you can take with a grain of salt, as all advice should, but hopefully it may actually be helpful to some people out there. And even though I'm directing this at the youth of the gay youth of today, some of this stuff can also be for just younger people. Um, and, I don't know, maybe older people can learn something from it, too. No way do I say that I'm a specialist in this. I'm speaking only of experience and of knowing people in this thing. And uh, it might get real messed up, but I'm hopefully going to... Uh, you'll see where I'm going with this. First of all, I want to start with saying, uh, if you are a young uh, gay youth, um, and whether that's a teen or early 20s, whatever, I just want to say that I am so in awe and in respect of you for, you know, living your life open. I come from a generation where it was slowly becoming open, but there was still a lot of fears. And don't get me wrong, I don't think the world is perfect. I think you still open yourself up to a world of hurt sometimes, but I think we are living in a, a, in a, an era that is a lot easier than before. And then me, I, there's a generation even, you know, several generations before me who had it even worse than I did. But I commend you. Uh, I could not have come out. I knew, as I said, when I was about probably seven or eight years old that I was gay. But, even growing up as a teen, I couldn't have even imagined having the strength uh, to come out. And I, I just am in, so in awe of the young people that come out and and uh, and just, you know, I'm this is me. Because I could not have done it. I came out in my late 20s, early 30s. But uh, I see a lot of, of things. And I decided to... I don't know why I feel I need to share my wisdom with them, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of will not even listen to this, but who knows? I've had a couple of young people that weren't gay that I've given advice. They've listened to it, and they thank me for it. So let's just go for it. Uh, so anyhow, I've given you your props, and I think that's amazing. A um, couple things. Uh, first of all, just because an older person reaches out to a younger male does not mean we are trying to get into your pants. Even if we think you're cute or handsome or, you know, you know, even a lesbian, you know, talking to a younger lesbian, it, we are not all just trying to sleep with you. We sometimes see stuff in you that reminds us of us. Or we see how open you are and how that could lead to some troubles. And although we're in awe of you for doing this, we kind of just want to shout out or reach out saying, hey, we've been there. I am so shocked at how many times I have tried to reach out to, well, just the gay community in general, but gay youths, and they've slapped my hand and basically said, uh, yeah, okay, you know, some didn't even acknowledge me. I may have told this story before, but one of my first Pride days in Hamilton, I was feeling great, you know, this was the first time I was going to be open and, you know, going to a Pride Day, and I walked up to a table that had three young people on it, and, you know, they were being friendly to people and stuff, and then I show up, and I decide to say, hello, happy Pride, and I literally, they look at me, check me up, up and down, 
hand me some pamphlets, and then just go on talking like I wasn't even there. Just because I was older, just because I wasn't handsome, just because I wasn't tall, just because I don't have a big floppy dick, you know, just because I'm not rich. And that is something that pisses me off about the gay community. But that's the gay community. That's not all yous. But I find that I, I expected the gay community to be so welcoming. And some of you young people are saying, it is welcoming. I've been in the gay community. Then say to yourself, are you good looking? Because if you're good looking or rich or have a big dick or whatever thing. Now, I'm not saying personality doesn't count in the gay community, but that's the one thing that you actually need to see over time. So, you know, if I come up and say, hello, happy pride, and you ignore me, that's, that's ridiculous. You should at least acknowledge, okay, this person is gay, and you don't know what their thing is. They might think I'm old and I've been to like 20 of these. They don't know. It could be my first time. I could just be coming out. It should be a welcoming place. You know, I've, I, I've told stories, and I can tell more stories about how I've tried to ingratiate in the gay community, but it was less respective than any other community. But anyhow, I digress. Anyhow, but uh, basically, so that's my thing. You know, don't necessarily just push someone away just because you're not attracted to them, or you think they're just being friend you. They may just literally just want to see if you're okay and stuff, and, you know, that's fine, you know, you're playing your cards early, because, you know, if you're pushing me away or don't have any interest in, you know, you should at least show some respect that this person has been through something and may have been through something. You should do that for everyone, whether you're gay or not. Always respect, because you don't know what the person's story is, so don't always just assume. Another thing I say is when you come out, a lot of gay youths, this really bothers me, is they just kick the door open. And that's great. You should embrace the gay community. You should embrace being gay. Watch gay movies. Post gay things on your Facebook. Paste this and that. You know, do what you want. But you know what? When I came out, I was gay and I was proud of it. And I did. I, I started reading on it. I started watching movies, listened to music based on it. But you know what? Gay was just a small part of what I was. I still had, like, my improv. I still had, you know, my friends. I still had movies. I still had all this other stuff going on in my life. So let those other sides of you show. Show us your hobbies. Show us, you know, do you play instruments? Do you like movies? Do you like music? You know, show us those aspects of you. Don't just make it about, I'm a top, I'm a bottom, and... I'm this, I'm that, because honestly, it's just, that's not all you are. Yes, I love that you embrace it, and you want everyone to know that you're gay, and, 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 and be as flamboyant as you want to be, or be non-flamboyant as you want to be. But don't just, you know, the best part about being anything, whether you're gay, straight, trans, anything, is that, when you show a richness of yourself and you show so many sides to you, that's the sides that people want to love. That's the people want to know and see. They don't want to just be reminded constantly, yes, yes, I get it, you're a bottom, you're a bottom, you're a bottom, you're a top, you're a top, you know, whatever you happen to be. And um, so, uh, yeah, so just, just, you know, show some variety. And, you know, I might be crazy, but that's one thing I knew. Because when I came out, yeah, I did like to say, hey, I'm gay, or I like to post things on my Facebook that blatantly showed I was gay. But I also like to post some of my favorite songs or movies I wanted to see, talked about other stuff that were going on in my life, you know, how I enjoyed, you know, role-playing and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, take that in consideration. Remember that it's not always just about you. I know sometimes that that's hard when you're young because you think the world is all about you, but it's when you start reaching out to other people and totally gripping and understanding this. I don't want to, like, point fingers or anything, but a, a little story I'll tell here is, um, and I won't mention any names because I'm not trying to, you know, point anyone out, but I find this in the the transgender community a lot that 
It becomes about them, no matter what the situation is. And I know this is a controversial thing, but they don't take in consideration how other people are feeling or how situations feel. It all has to be, you're not respecting my needs, you're not respecting mine. And it becomes, well, you've got to respect other people too. I taught an improv boot camp a little while ago, and there was a trans guy in there. Uh, very nice, very nice uh, guy, and uh, re very talented too. And apparently he had been coming for quite some time, and uh, or a couple of times at least. And and I, this was my first time teaching him, and I was trying to be very respectful, trying to make sure I was saying, you know, he he, you know, being gender specific you know, using, you know, the person's name as much as possible because I don't just see people as women, men, but sometimes, you know, our subconscious does. And I noticed a couple of the other students were slipping up and saying, you know, she, she. And then I remember at the end of the thing, I told everybody, you know, great time, I, you know, they did good work. And um, this young gentleman came up to me and said, uh, I just wanted to let you know that I'm a, a boy. And I said, oh, yeah, okay. And, um, you know, he said, you know, a couple times you referred to me as a she. And so I apologized profu profusely. And I just said, look, sorry, I did not mean it out of any kind of malice or harm. I, you know, I will work on that. Uh, I said, I have some friends that are, are trans or have changed in the transition, and it's taken me some time to just, because, you know, you're doing this all the time, and then all of a sudden, you're changing it. Like, I can think of a friend who actually changed his name. I knew him growing up as one name, and then he changed the name, and it took me some time. And you got to understand that even people that I know in my life, it's sometimes hard. But anyhow, I, I thought I was doing a good job with it, and when I went home that night, I thought about it, and I said, you know what, I really did try, and I don't think I slipped up. I think other people did, and he put that on me, and that's fine. If he felt out of place or out of sorts, then he had every right to talk to me. But I thought to myself, too, you know, if I, he'd come like a couple times to my class specifically, and I was still doing it. This, even two classes, I'd say he had every right to talk to me. But the fact that it was one time, and I swear I did not do it. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. But I swear I kept my thing. The fact that at the end of the night, and he calls me out on it, and as I said, every right to do so. But the fact that it was the first time I had taught him, that basically I felt, again, you made the issue all about you, you know? And I'm not saying it isn't, but I, I, I'm not doing it maliciously. Like, I'm blatantly gay myself, you know? I, I respect and, and thing. But, you know, I, I just felt personally, it's like, again, you got to give props to, like, well, these people are just meeting you. They're just dealing with you, and... You know, yes, you're dressed as a man and you live the life as a man, but some of us still see woman. And give us some time, even though I swear, I swear I did not screw up once because I'm very, try to res be respectful of that. I have been known to screw up once or twice, but I know that night I worked really hard, but I know other people didn't, and, and that's fine. Being the teacher, it should go on my shoulders. But just telling you, and this isn't just about trans, this is about gay people. You know, you try to make it an issue every chance you can, and you shouldn't. You've got to respect the other people, too. Fight, pick your issues. There are issues out there. Trust me, you're going to find issues out there. But pick your battles. Don't make everything a battle. Don't make everything like, oh, this was totally against me. Because it's not. That's just the way the world works. I don't care if you're straight, gay, gay. A leprechaun. I don't care what you are. That's just the way the world works. Anyhow, um, so I'm just saying, just respect other people that they think. That going so, uh, I had a very, I was very lucky that I did not lose any friends, as far as I know. 
or family because of coming out. I didn't have a big coming out. I've talked about it in past episodes. I won't talk about it again, but, uh, well, maybe again, but not this segment. But another thing I, I strongly must urge is, um, I know it's difficult coming out and, uh, and, and it should be a little, but again, if your family or friends say something that is insulting to you, don't burn the bridge right away. Keep in mind, you have come out. You've dealt with this. You've played it in your mind over and over again. The people you are telling are processing this in five, ten minutes. You know, in the t time you're talking with them, the hour you're talking with them. They haven't had time to let it sink in, and they have not had time on their own to process their thoughts. Um, somebody might say something inappropriate, but keep in mind, they haven't had time to process it yet. So you've got to give them the respect for that, as in, okay, I'm going to give you a little time. Now, if they have had the time and still can't deal with it, then by all means, you know, you start burning your bridges. Hopefully you don't have to, because, you know, they're actually burning the bridge. It's not you. So don't feel like it is. And I always think if you do lose somebody because of coming out, then they were probably not somebody you wanted. And it might be hard to walk away from a family member or a good friend that just doesn't accept you. But if they're not going to accept you, you don't want them around when they're just pretending to accept you. Finally, I'm going to say this. Um, don't let anyone out you. Um, if somebody outs you, it breaks my heart the most. Uh, because coming out is such a personal time. And you may have other friends that are out that are pushing you to come out but you need to have the right time i couldn't have come out when i was a teen i just wasn't strong enough i had to wait till i'm older some people wait till way older to come out because they can't deal with it and you need to know when your time is don't let anyone else tell you it's time what i can tell you is that when i did come out it was one of the greatest things i ever did I finally got to be myself more around people, and the people who wanted to be in my life stayed in my life. As I said, I didn't lose much, but I may have, you know, learned some people weren't there. I remember my sister-in-law, Cheryl, uh, telling me her father is a real, he's no longer with us, but he used to be a real homophobic person. He was very old school. I had known him for a good chunk of my life, and then when I finally came out, Every time I'd meet him, he would just be still sweet as pie to me, joking around just like anything happened. And my sister-in-law, Cheryl, confronted him and said, you know, you don't like gay people, but you seem to have no problem with Devlin. And he said, that's because I got to know him. That's because he wasn't just a gay person. He's Devlin. And that kind of brings together all the vice I just said into one little story. If you present yourself of who you are the best you can, and you wait for the right moment to come out, it'll all make sense. But once you do, the world is open to you. And whether you want to be flamboyant or whether you want to be just yourself, but now I'm out, that's your choice. There is no one way or another, and enjoy everything of it. I may sit there and tell you, don't be so, everything is gay, 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 gay. But if you are that way, enjoy it. Embrace it. Just remember to not be afraid to let the other colors of your rainbow show. That's just one small person of who you are. And what I always tell people is to just be the best person you can be. And that's all you can do. But when you show ultimate sides of it, it could. I kept my relationships with friends because they didn't see me as gay. Some of them speculated. Some of them knew. But because I showed them other sides to me, when I became gay, some were actually intrigued by it. They wanted to know how long I had been dealing with this. It was a huge thing. I did a monologue show about it, and I had people who knew me all my lives who did not know the dark sides I was going through before I came out. 
Everybody's story is different. And I know the advice I tell you, you can take in little pieces or something. But if you find yourself in a situation where you think, oh, yeah, he told me that, didn't he? Yeah, he's older. He probably went through that. And there's a lot of people out there who unfortunately have to go through it before they learn from it. But it doesn't hurt to listen to this advice. And maybe some of it will sink in. I promise you it's good advice. Anyhow, that's the end of my show. I got a great show next week planned. I know some segments I'm doing. I'm, I'm going to be doing some interviewing of some people with local businesses, which I'm very excited about sharing with you. I also should have a, another summer movie guide coming up for you. I enjoyed doing that last year, and I'm going to do it again this year. Anyhow, until then, I've had a lovely time with you, and thank you for taking this time with me, and I'll talk to you very soon.